now. Hello, everyone. Yet yeah, once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today, we're doing an episode in our apologetic season on the divinity of Christ, on the divinity of Jesus Christ, and it's with uh, Dr. Michael Bird, and we're going to be jumping into this conversation here in a moment, but as always, some show note reminders. If you go on our show notes, you can find a few links, some helpful links there. One of them is to find the closest confessional or Reformed church near your area, so click that link, find the closest Reformed denominations near you, so you can find one to call home or refer to somebody else. You can find out information on how to contact Peter or myself, whether it's email, guiltgracepod at gmail.com, if it's Twitter or Instagram, which is the handle for both, is at guiltgracepod. You can also um, decide to be a bridge builder. Click that Patreon link, and if you're able and willing to uh, help us financially move our podcast forward, that's great. Um, we also have some words from our sponsors like Logos Bible Software. Halfway through this episode, you'll hear some words from some of our sponsors. So yeah, we'll jump right in and let Peter further introduce Michael Bird today. Yeah, we have Dr. Michael Bird. He's a leading academic on New Testament studies and Christian theology. He's a lecturer in theology at Ridley College in Melbourne, Australia. I think I'm pronouncing it right. He's also the author or editor of more than 30 books, including What Christians Ought to Believe, Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible, and Evangelical Theology. He writes at michaelfbird.substack.com. It can also be followed at mbird12. And it's a pleasure having you on, Dr. Bird. Yeah, well, it's great to be with you, Peter and Nick. Hope you're keeping it real down in the OC. Oh, yeah, that's uh, we were we were joking before. Yeah, that's this is the second guest we've had who's actually in the future because you're you're in Australia and it's Friday morning over there right now. And we were asking before, oh, wow. so maybe let our audience know what what does the future look like. It's bleak, my friend. It's a post-apocalyptic world. Pets <laughs> rising up against their owners. Children sassing their mothers. That sounds there's exactly a com- like the world There's right a complete now. shortage of Dr. Yeah. Pepper. The Dr. Fa- Pepper factories around the world suffer a terrorist attack. There's no more Dr. Pepper. You don't want to live in this world, my friend. Get your near- nearest suicide pills and take them. Oh, my. oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that went from for real to real, real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Good. This is the, the thing uh, he's joking. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's hope he's joking. Yeah, let's, yes. let's really hope he's. That's really hope he's. And this is, I think, I mean, this is probably not a first, but maybe one of the very few podcasts where a baby might be born right in the middle of this episode because uh, Nick is in the waiting room or the labor room. I'm not really sure where he's at right now. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, you'll see where he's at, the waiting room. Waiting room. Yeah, it should be, it's, it's going to be a little later today. So yeah, we're um, recording this on September 22nd. You guys are hearing this a few months mm-hmm. after that, but we're recording this September 22nd. So. Um, yeah, so Dr. Bird, maybe to to kind of catch people up on who you are, if they haven't heard you, you, you run a, you've done a podcast with another person we've had on, Amy Bird, so Birds of a Feather, so a couple of things. Yeah, yeah we've been talking about some of your books, um, but maybe let our listeners know a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and what you do. Okay, well, first of all, amigos, brothers, call me Mike. No one calls me Dr. Bird. <laughs> okay, just call me Mike. Um yeah, well, I'm an Anglican priest. I teach at a Anglican uh, theological college in Melbourne. Uh, I've also taught at a, a Reform College in the Highland Theological College up in the north of Scotland. Oh yeah, that's yep. where the real Presbyterians are, my friend. Right. Yeah, you got where the yeah. haggis, where the haggis is, the haggis is fresh, and the beards are so thick and full <laughs> they've been accused of heteronormative hate crimes. <laughs> So I've been, <laughs> I've been with the real Presbyterians, are man. Right, you're you're like Simpsons Presbyterian. That's I'm a Scottish <laughs> oh, Presbyterian. That's, that's right. Simpsons Presbyterian. It's real Presbyterian. Every conversation begins with the words "Oh hi." Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I've taught I've taught in a number of places. I've taught in Scotland. I've taught in Brisbane. Um, I travel a little bit to the U.S. You know, get to visit a few different places around your glorious land. And yeah, I'm rather keen on Jesus and I write on a wide variety of topics um, ranging from uh, the Septuagint, historical Jesus, Apostle Paul, Christian thought, and uh, early church history. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we'll be 
<clears throat> talking about some of these things, and especially so the divinity of Jesus today, because we're kind of we're in our New Testament kind of portion of our apologetics. So talking about this historical divine Jesus, we're going to talk about some of that stuff. You've written and you've spoken quite a bit on the historical Jesus, New Testament backgrounds, and early Christology. So what first got you into Jesus studies? Uh, well, I, like I said, I am rather keen on Jesus. Um, you know, the whole Lord and Savior thing is well and truly working for me. Yep. yep. So, yeah, I mean, that's the that's number one thing. I mean, uh, anyone who's into um, Christian faith will be attracted magnet magnetically, devotionally, doxologically mm -hmm. um, to the study and interest in Jesus. So I want to know about, you know, um, Jesus, the man, the man, Christ Jesus, uh, you know, uh, what he said, what he did, his death, resurrection, that type of thing, you know, what his teachings were. So I'm interested in the historical side. Cause, you know, it's like you've got to know the context of things as well, because there's always the danger. We There's always the danger to paint Jesus in your own image, oh, yeah. the image yep. of your own culture. Yep. And historical Jesus study is a good check against mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. You've got to get back in the nitty gritty life of ancient Galilee, ancient Judea. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the historical side of that. But with, with, with history, it's not just a matter of what Jesus said and did as if we are interested in a curatorial Christianity. We're not just interested. We're not just history buffs. Mm -hmm. It's not just who was Jesus. I'm also interested in who is Jesus according to the apostolic proclamation. So what do we, what, what is said and affirmed about Jesus by Paul, by, by Luke in the book of Hebrews in the book of revelation and I'm also interested in the question, not not just who was Jesus, who is Jesus in apostol apostolic preaching, um, but what is Jesus doing now and who will Jesus um, reveal himself uh, to be you know, as Lord and judge on the final day? So yeah, Christology is a topic that uh, remains at the forefront of all of my theological interests. Yeah, and you've we were talking about this before recording. So <clears throat> one of the first actually theological books I had ever read was how Jesus be how how God became Jesus, and then realizing it was a response to Bart Ehrman on how Jesus became God, and we're gonna be kind of touching on some of this stuff. Um, but this I kind of bridges into Nick's first question too on some of the work that you've done. Yeah, yeah. My first question would be: What are the most dominant views concerning the divinity or mere humanity of Jesus of Nazareth? Well, th things have changed a little bit. Once upon a time, um, some scholars thought, well, Jesus was just a, a mere man, a prophet, and then um, they regarded him as a type of a exalted figure. And then by the time you get to the Gospel of John, then he becomes God. So there's a type of an evolution of, you know, going from prophet to, you know, maybe after his resurrection, well, then he became the Messiah. Then they thought he might be the heavenly son of man, and then he became God. And when you, by the time you get to you know John's gospel, uh, I think that paradigm is out. Uh, everyone says, look, um, certainly at the resurrection, um, people start thinking of Jesus as divine. Um, but the question is, in what sense? Because there's different ways of being divine in the ancient world. I mean, an angel, an angelic being, is a type of heavenly creature i mean does heavenly and divine mean the same thing uh is jesus divine in the same way that the healing god asclepius was divine or like a deified emperor you know the yep. emperor augustus or mm -hmm. the uh emperor um claudius was you know was deified so is jesus divine in the same sense of a deified emperor so people are saying he's he, so scholarship broadly saying he's div div divine but in what sense? And we can add to that, there's a few different views of thinking about. Some would say, well, he's divine in a functional sense. Okay, so he's not specifically as divine as God the Father, but he's got a few divine functions like saving, judging, you know, transcends heaven, earth, you know, which, which kind of overlaps with the angels, kind of overlaps with God the Father. Uh, others would say, like less like Larry Hurtado, saying, well, no, yeah. forget all the Christological titles and stuff. Look at the devotional habits. Christians worshipped Jesus as to a God. I mean, you, you've learned that from pagan authors. So what you have to look at is the devotional habits, the devotional practices. They they tell you that he's divine. And then you get someone like Richard Balcom, who argues 
Uh, well, no, actually, you know, worship could be done in an, a wide variety of ways. All sorts of things were worshipped. He thinks what you need to go for is divine identity. And that is you have the God of Israel's unique identity as the creator, the one with the unique name, Yahweh, and how Jesus himself participates in that, how the role of creation is attributed to him, how he is also considered Lord, how the Yahweh texts of the Old Testament are consistently being applied to Jesus. So there's different senses in trying to figure out what he's doing. Uh, I've got a forthcoming book uh, uh, about to drop in the next month called Jesus Among the Gods, oh, yeah. where I yep. basically try to compare and contrast yeah. Jesus with all the different ways of being divine to try identify in what sense Jesus is divine. And what I notice is that in the ancient world, they seem to have this basic taxonomy, okay? There were two, two ways of being divine. Either you were a unbegotten deity, which is kind of like Zeus, or you were a begotten deity, you know, like a Hercules who comes down to heaven, well, he's, you know, a human, born a human being, but then he comes divine. And if that's the ancient taxonomy of divinity, which one is Jesus? And I think I can show as early as the New Testament that Christian authors are applying to Jesus uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the language, the conceptuality of Jesus as an unbegotten, unbecre uncreated deity. I mean, you certainly get that in the in the Gospel of John. I mm -hmm. think you find it in Hebrews, and I think you arguably find it in Paul's letters as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a, that's just a snapshot yeah. of um, where scholarship is at on the question of Jesus's divinity and a little promo for my own little thing about to drop. Oh, yeah, promo it up. Yeah, yeah. Talk up your works. We'll... we'll promo those as much as we can well cool. yeah i'm gonna ask my last question here so i can cut a little early uh, for obvious reasons but uh yeah and then let you guys uh, carry on but uh yeah my my last question would be when it comes to the gospels in particular and the writings of the new testament in general what or does jesus claim divinity and is that claim shared with those around him We'll also ask some about trusting these documents as well. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the issue, did Jesus claim to be divine, has been one of the big questions, okay? Mm. And, I mean, for some people, they think it's absurd. If anyone thinks they're God, then they're just a lunatic. So some people say it's, it's, it's off the question. And you have to admit, Jesus did not rock around Galilee and Judea with a big neon sign saying, okay. hey, I'm yep. God, I'm going to die for your sins very shortly. After that, you should probably get down on your knees and worship me. Uh, if anything, and, the opposite. He like he holds his identity pretty close to the... To his, to his exactly, uh, as a Messiah and, and all sorts of things. Uh, the other thing is there are some texts like Mark 10, where the rich young ruler says, you know, what must I do to be saved? Good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Yeah. So the premise behind that, people like to point out, is that Jesus is saying he's not God because God alone is good. I'm not God, so don't call me good. I mean, you can see where a number of scholars are coming from yeah. with that. But this is what we can say. Jesus seems to speak with a sense of unmediated divine authority. He doesn't say the word of the Lord came to me as it happened to Jeremiah or mm -hmm. Ezekiel or Obadiah. Not he doesn't go around else to another people. It's coming directly from someone. Exactly. He doesn't say the word of the Lord came to me. He doesn't say, well, you know, this rabbi says this, this rabbi says that, but I've got my own opinion on this particularly you know, thorny issue. Uh, he, he, he tends, he speaks with the sense of, you know, you've heard it said, but I tell you, and he can, he can even do this when it comes to talking about the old Testament. Uh, you know, when he's got the, you know, the, the, the question of like, um, you know, is it okay to divorce your wife? And he says, well, you know, that you, that's in there in the law, but that was not the main purpose of the law. The law was there. That part is a kind of band aid solution. There's actually something better than the law. And let me tell you what it is. Now, when you're offering a view that you claim is better than the law, uh, you're making a fairly elevated claim yeah. for yourself there. Uh, the other thing we can note is that he, one of the big hopes for the, for, the, for the coming of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in, 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 in first century Judea, okay, it meant the coming of God as king, okay? Uh, go read Isaiah 52, mm -hmm. you know, go read, I mean, all of, you know, 40 to 55, go mm -hmm. read parts of Zechariah. The kingdom of God is the coming of God in mm -hmm. his kingly power. And Jesus talks about that with himself 
as the king of God's kingdom, as the messianic anointed royal leader of God's holy people, he puts himself at the center of that. And the line between, you know, God's own kingship and Jesus as the agent can get a little bit blurry. And he begins to talk, particularly when you get to Luke 19, you know, 44 to 45, he's, he weeps over Jerusalem because mm-hmm. it did not recognize its time of visitation. And this is the language of the visitation of God. Okay. So Jesus himself is embodying the return of Yahweh to Zion. Okay. That, that seems to be what is going in himself. God is becoming king and returning to Zion. And then you, you even get this at his very trial. You know, when Jesus is before the uh, the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas, so look, you, are you the Messiah, you know, the, the, son, the son of God or what? Yeah. And then Jesus, he says, and Jesus says, I am, and he says, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with glory and the holy ones and that kind of thing. Now, what is very interesting, and this is something your leaders need to, your uh, listeners need to reflect on, is that those words, this is a quote from Mark 14, 62. Mm -hmm. It is a conflation of two texts, Psalm 110, verse 1, and Daniel 7, 13. Now, I'm going to ask you, Peter, Mm -hmm. and for your reason, what do those two texts have in common? Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies for footstool. And Daniel 7, 13, um, you know, the son of man came unto the ancient of days and he was given all dominion, power, might, and authority. What do those two texts have in common? Maybe like an eschatological context? Uh, they're applied that way, so you're correct in that. But they both refer to someone being co-enthroned with Yahweh. Oh, true, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And it's not like you can have your own mini throne. You can be the you know deputy minister yeah. for you know Palestinian affairs. Yep. Uh, they both are co-enthroned with Yahweh, yep. which implies co-regency and equality. Jesus is saying, "I'm going to share in the orbit of divine sovereignty." Yeah. Which is why um, Caiaphas throws a big hissy fit, tears his thing, and says, this is the most blasphemous thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, you are totally going to get um, crucified for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so and, and that's so he claims he's going to be co-enthroned, or already is, you know, like in Luke and Matthew, it's from now on you will see the Son of Man. Hmm. So this is a big, when you claim you're going to be co-enthroned, with the Lord of the universe, this is kind of a big deal. So Jesus claims he is God, but he does it in a very Jewish way. Hmm. Okay. So like I said, he speaks with unmediated divine authority. He believes in himself. Um, God is is coming to to, to Zion and coming as king. He has the authority to forgive sins. Okay. That kind of thing. And he also says at the very end, he's going to be co-enthroned with the creator of the universe and Israel's covenant God. Yeah. Now, th- that's not him saying, Jesus saying, I am God mm-hmm. in that way. Um, people kind of want him just to say like, I'm God and like kind of conversations over. And, and, and this is, this is the problem I find in a lot of scholarly li- literature. Basically when it comes to be Jesus being divine, either they, they say, well, look, the, Jesus is obviously divine in the gospel of John. What you're saying is not the same thing as the gospel of John obviously then your your jesus is not divine and i'm like well there's different ways of saying that okay there's a different ways of of getting to the same sort of point or different language conceptuality terms and 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 narratives the other thing is people seem to think for jesus to claim to be god he has to make a statement that is in effect modalistic like unless he says i am the father or the father and i are one yeah uh, Yeah. or i'm just the father's twin brother (laughs) <laughs> um, some scholars um, think that unless he comes to something like that, then it's not a claim to divinity. And so that's my frustration. People say, well, unless it's the same as the Gospel of John or unless it's explicitly modalistic, it's not a claim to divinity. Whereas I say unto you, um, <laughs> uh-huh. Jesus is claiming to be divine uh, with some degree of ambiguity, with some degree of ambiguity, but he's doing it in a very Jewish way. And if you follow the bouncing ball, Uh, I think it does become quite evident that he is claiming not just to have a unique filial relationship with Israel's God, not just the representative God, but he is the very um, embodiment. 
He is the very reality and he is the definitive agent mm. of Israel's God. Mm. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Maybe to, to peel this back a little bit too, um, to try to get to some background, because uh, you, you've written a lot on Greco-Roman background. You, you co-authored a book uh, with N.T. Wright on some of this stuff and a lot of other works talks about this. Um, to the Gospels and New Testament in general, so what if like what were they expecting a messiah to be were they expecting like a god were they expecting a god man were they expecting somebody who's kind of like god or more of a prophet where jesus comes in it's it doesn't seem to quite fit their expectations and i think this kind of plays into the divinity they don't recognize oh this is the divine in flesh yeah well i mean it's mixed first of all not every judean every jew of the ancient world was expecting or hoping for a messiah yeah okay so i mean the, the sadducees were quite happy with the oh, current yeah. status quo. They were yeah. not looking yeah. um, for a Messiah. Messiah was either going to cause a big ruckus, a civil war, a Roman invasion. So they just wanted to keep the peace on behalf of their Roman masters. The deal is, so he not, surely it, catches people off guard. They're not. They're not expecting this. Yeah. Uh, and we do know that there are some people who are expecting, like you get this in a document called the Psalms of Solomon. Yeah. Uh, they're expecting a more Davidic militaristic Messiah, yeah. more as kind of like a, you know, an anointed general who will eventually become king and liberate God's people. Yeah. Uh, in the Qumran scrolls and the Dead Sea scrolls, it's a little bit more complex. They mm -hmm. seem to envisage uh, two messiahs, one of David, one of Aaron, kind of like the two sons of oil from you know, Zechariah 6. These, you know, two like king and priest who will work together, liberate God's people, mm -hmm. um, maybe more of a militaristic side. But there, there was a tradition of seeing the Messiah as a kind of uh, potentially a heavenly figure. And, and that becomes, I think, maybe more prominent after 70 AD. So when you get to some Jewish apocalypses, like what I think is the parables of one Enoch, which I think is post uh, 70 uh, for Ezra which is another um, post-70 Jewish apocalypse, they seem to envisage a far more transcendent and heavenly Messiah, which I do think influences some of the messianic discourse of early Christianity, hence you get to the book of Revelation and, and that sort of a thing. Yep. And, yeah, but, and But some could think of the Messiah at least as one as arrayed with heavenly power or, you know, su supernatural qualities. So there was a diverse range of messianic types uh, and Jesus can maybe touch upon mm -hmm. some of them, mm -hmm. but one thing that nobody was really expecting was a crucified Messiah. Okay. Cause that was like, you know, fried ice. Okay. It did, it <laughs> yeah. did, not, it yeah. did not make, I mean, if you get crucified, yeah, you got to do it on goes to show... your background. You're like, I don't think you can be crucified because you're divine. Yeah, it's exactly so, you know, it's, I mean, ex exactly, you know, if it suffers, it's not God, you know, God cannot suffer. So a suffering God was an anathema, uh, a crucified Messiah did not make any sense. The idea of, you know, martyrdom, thing, you know, a, a prophet who had been martyred, that type of thing, but a, a Messiah who dies and rises uh, and who embodies, if you like, the suffering and vindication of God's people, that was probably not big on the agenda. Now, if you read Israel scriptures in a certain way, Mm -hmm. that does gain traction and coherence if you read it in light of certain religious experiences in what of jesus said so and this is what richard hayes called reading backwards you know after you've ex after the christ event if you read backwards you go aha i understand that now in in retrospect you can see that so it, it, so jesus is saying and doing things um which in some cases reiterate messianic hopes in some senses um uh, intensify them and in other places kind of uh, transform them and take them in a new direction. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so continuing on this, this might be a hair difficult to, so if you want to just shoot your shot on this, but what were some of these expectations? It's, they may not have had total expectations for this, but um, were, were these in line with either the Hebrew scriptures, the second temple period, more so like, is what they saw were they were they when they were looking at him were they thinking in their mind i mean we can't look at psychologically what they're what they're thinking but is is this in line with is basically what i'm asking is jesus in line with what they're expecting all, all these kind of things that were coming around to so those who were expecting him um is this is what they is this what they thought is this is this divine divine were they expecting a divine man or were they expecting like a, a prophet of sorts well, it varies. Them? Again, you can get some people who are expecting a Messiah um, with supernatural powers and transcendent qualities. But again, 
I think that's mostly post. Well, it's not some of it. It, it becomes more prominent post seventy. Yeah. But again, you can find certain things where they thought the Messiah would have certain qualities. Others expected just an earthly Messiah, you yeah. know, like a military leader. So it's it's very. You can't say one way or another which one were they expecting because they was a lot of different people with yeah, a lot yeah. of different views. Yeah. One thing we can say for certain, you know, historically. Uh, is that Jesus certainly excited messianic enthusiasm, hmm. okay? Jesus was saying and doing things that led people to ask, is this guy the Messiah, okay? So irrespective of what they what their expectations were, what type of Messiah hmm. they were thinking about or hoping for, Jesus certainly excited or in... Um, generated some messianic hopes now there's a debate in scholarship as to whether jesus ever claimed to be the messiah or is that people think just they just thought about him but i think well if they thought it about him it's based on what he was doing and he kind exactly. of you know maybe he yeah. knew what he was doing yeah uh so i think he i, I wrote a whole book on this called are you the one who is to come yep um well i think jesus did indeed claim to be the messiah and he excited messianic hopes and i mean you see that you know in places like mark chapter eight where you know, Peter says, you are the Messiah, you know, the, 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 the son of, of God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then he defines, he says, you, I am the Messiah, and we're going to go to Jerusalem where the son of man will be crucified, you know, handed over, scourged by the Gentiles, and on the third day he will rise, yeah. which again doesn't make any sense to the disciples because this just completely deconstructs the whole category of what they were at least thinking the Messiah is and what he should do, what he should be, and what he, what should happen to him. Okay. Yeah, so to, to add some of this stuff, so we see, we've talked a little bit about the Gospels. Um, we'll talk somewhat about Paul as well. But are, are, is there anything outside of the Gospels, outside of the, the kind of, you can call it the Christian text, um, or early Christian or non-Christian writings that attest to Jesus' divinity? They, they, they see the same things, or they corroborate whatever is being said in the Gospels, and do they share kind of the same understanding that the New Testament authors put forth? Uh, well, it's a bit mixed. We get a number of different authors referring to Jesus, like uh, Josephus, I believe, Suetonius, Tacitus. Probably the one of the most interesting ones is Pliny the Younger when he's governor of Bithynia, yep. and he's trying to figure out what the heck to do with yep. these Christians. Yeah. Certainly people who have been denounced as Christians. Yeah, and he's okay, like early, so it's like, second century. Yeah, so, you know, someone's like, there's there's like one baker and he doesn't like the baker across the road. So he tells the governor, I reckon the guy across the road is a Christian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, plenty of things. Well, what do I do with that? It's just an anonymous accusation. And so he writes to the Roman emperor saying, you know, I mean, if I find any Christians, I just flat out kill them. But what do I do with all these random, um, you know, accusations? And, you know, he, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's told not to do anything about mm -hmm. it unless there's specific evidence. But he actually describes what Christians do. He describes how he's got like two deaconesses um, in the church who are both slave slave women. And he, he kind of kind of interrogates them. And he says, well, what they seem to do is get together, um, you know, share some, you know, a little bit of, I think, prayers and stuff. And then he says, and they sing, they sing a hymn to Christ as to a God. Hmm. So uh, that is, that, that's interesting. Certainly Pliny knows hmm. uh, that in the early second century, um, Christians are worshiping Jesus in a way that would be analogous to a way that, you know, pagans would sing hymns. I mean, that's the categories that he applies hmm. to it. Um, I mean, we, we can go into a lot of other early Christian literature. You can look at uh, documents like the uh, the Didache, yep, which is you know, roughly contemporaneous with with later parts of the New Testament. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's got some interesting stuff. You know, you know, instead of saying Hosanna to the Son of David, they've got Hosanna to the God of David. Hmm. You know, which is very interesting. They apply the the title Jesus to, to of Lord. I mean, that's the main title for him. He's called Lord over and over they've got them you know the famous maranatha prayer you get in 1 corinthians 16 22 you find the same prayer being prayed in the didache which is which i think is G the the future coming of jesus as uh, imagined as the coming of god in judgment that's what i think the maranatha law it's about the coming of god in judgment and that is applied to jesus 
Mm. We could go all the way through to the uh, another Christian author, Ignatius of Antioch, mm. several of his letters. I, he says something that's absolutely fascinating, but people haven't really made much of. He basically says Jesus is uh, begotten in his humanity, but unbegotten in his divinity. Mm. Now, this, this, I mean, people haven't made much of this. I don't know. I think this is, you know, one of the, you know, most def- uh, profound statements yeah. Yeah. that he yeah. he has real humanity. He is yep. he is begotten in his humanity, but he is unbegotten. Okay, which is saying he is an uncreated divine being. This is so he's got a, a, a pure humanity, a true humanity, but he's also got the highest quality of divinity. Mm-hmm. And this is you know in the first quarter of the second century. And I I don't think he's I don't think that's an innovation. He's mm-hmm. largely simply summarizing what people have believed about Jesus probably for some time. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of literature and we could keep going all the way yeah. through to the, the council of Nicaea and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So maybe to, in general, so the kind of early Christian writings, they're not kind of making something new that wasn't the case. They're just, they're recognizing, Oh, we've been doing this for quite a bit. Yeah. And I think, you know, from the, and so even Bart Ehrman would concede now, Bart Ehrman would say, you know, he changed his mind. He once thought Jesus was, you know, from Jewish prophet to Gentile God. That's what a guy called Morris Casey argued. Even Ehrman says, look, from the moment of resurrection, they regarded Jesus as a divine being. Hmm. Now, where, where Ehrman is correct is to ask in what sense hmm. is he? I mean, if divinity is a kind of a pyramid, is he somewhere like halfway up the pyramid, close uh-huh. to the top? So, I mean, that's what Ehrman wants to, he wants to see it up along the sort of pyramid of, you know, relative uh, divinity. And there was, and there was an ancient pyramid of divinity. I mean, levels of being divine in an ancient pantheon or in the ancient world. But for my mind, very early on, I think people regard Jesus as divine in a more absolute sense, Mm -hmm. Uh, being, you know, being one with God, the father, being a unbegotten, uncreated being um now that's not to say there's a lot of diversity in early christian presentations you see that the new testament you know various different titles applied to jesus i mean there's a different texture from the christology of the synoptic gospels to the christology of john you know paul's got his own sort of unique thing going on similarly in hebrews or in the book of revelation so there is a a, a certain di- uh, diversity of uh, accounts of Jesus and his how he acts as both the agent of the Father and yet he still seems to be everywhere uh, a revelation of God, the Lord and Savior, both the agent and the very the very manifestation of uh, the God of Israel to his people. Hmm. This is this is not one that I I'd sent you, but I'm just curious because there does seem to be um, a divorce between Jesus doing divine things that you'd only expect a divine person to do uh, in the new Testament. And it doesn't seem like the disciples catch on. Like they don't, they don't, it's not until his resurrection. They're like, Oh, I get it. Or when Pentecost comes like, Oh, I get it. Is it like, what's, is that, is that like something that the scholars are like, they're trying to figure out like, Oh, Jesus does things, but they don't recognize it until later on. Is that, is there like a tension in that too? Well, I think that is, you, you see a lot of that. Uh, and you know, when Jesus forgives the sins of the paralytic man, it's the I think it's the the, the faff, if I remember correctly. It's the the, the scribes uh, who are perplexed by this. I mean, how can you forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Yeah. Uh, God alone, they say, can forgive sins, and they don't kind of make the <laughs> connection. Well, obviously, I mean, the fact that the guy is healed goes to show that I can do that. And if God alone can forgive sins, then I'm just do the math. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But they they can't because they, they there's a there's just a mental block there that this is. I mean, human beings can't be def- divine. I mean, Philo of Alexandria, who's one of the, the the most important witnesses to, you know, ancient Jewish views of anything. I mean, he says, you know, uh, sooner could God become man than man become God. He believed the chasm between, you know, God and humanity was so great. You can't have incarnation and you can't have deification. He ruled out both. So if Philo was reading, you know, John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, no problems. He believes that God has his eternal word, which is either an angel or a personification of God himself. But when you get to John 1, 14, and the word became flesh, he's like, whoa, I'm checking out. I can't do this. This doesn't work for me. So I, that's, that's part of the issue. People have just got categories that 
do not allow um, a human being to become God unless something happens that really changes that and transforms that. Okay, so that's the, that's the first thing. When it comes to the disciples, yeah, Jesus does say stuff that they go, you know, wow, this is this is weird and in a kind of scary sense. Like, you know, when he can order the wind and the waves, you know, he 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 calms the the waters on the Sea of Galilee, and they say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? So the question is looming, but they just don't know what to say. That they, they they're struggling for a category. It's like, okay, Messiah. It's kind of like, you know, Messiah premium is what they seem to be thinking. Uh, but what's that premium um, aspect that they that, that they have there? That, that, that they're not sure. And eventually they, they finally get there. And, they, and, and the way that they think about you, I mean, their main text for explaining who Jesus is, uh, is Psalm 110. Mm-hmm. That's, their main, that's their main text. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's the, that's the John 3.16 before we had John 3.16. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was Psalm 110 was the verse that they were going to, or Psalm 2.6, yeah. or Psalm 118, you know, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It's marvelous in our eyes. Or well, Daniel 7.13, yes. uh, that's, that, that's the categories they were using to explain who Jesus is. Hmm. Okay. And you've talked about, we've talked about him a little bit. Um, and so you've, you've interacted with Barterman. and you've, you've written a book in response to him and, um, talked to him and, and debated uh, and, and amongst other people too. I think he's just the biggest name people think of. Uh, you've ga- engaged with those at the Jesus seminar, uh, again, amongst a, a bunch of others. Um, what's so maybe to, to kind of throw them a bone, what, what is their strongest argument against the Jesus's divine nature? Um, not talking about his human nature, but his divine nature. And how would you help some of our listeners respond to this? Okay. Well, I mean, l- let me say two things. Er- er- Ehrman wrote his book, um, how God became Jesus. Yeah. And as soon as I saw that book advertised, my heart sank. Since I knew I was going to be getting emails from all <laughs> over the world. <laughs> yep. Um, and I mean, so and and you know, Muslims love his books. Muslim, he he sells a lot of books to yeah. Muslims. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like the the unreliability of the New Testament. Jesus is not God. Muslims love his book. For Muslims, it's like all their Christmases come at once. Um. <laughs> Which is funny if you think about it. That's true. Um, yeah. And um, so I, I, I put together a, a, a posse of um, righteous scholarly um, homeboys. I put put the put the squad together, and we wrote a response to that. And that's got some great articles in it. Simon Gathercall, Craig Hill, um, uh, not Craig, I, I, uh, Craig, uh, who is it? Hill, um, Charles Hill, Charles, Craig yep. Evans, yep. Um, um, and uh, you know we've uh, also got um. Yeah, I mean, a whole bunch of good people involved in yep. uh, in that. Uh, Chris Tilling. And, yes, yeah, so we got a response to to Ehrman on that topic. Um, now, where a- Ehrman is correct um, is that, you know, there's different ways of being divine and there is a diversity of views in the New Testament. And some texts can be interpreted in different ways. So let me give you an example. If you go to somewhere like Philippians 2, 6 to 11, the famous, the famous Christ hymn or the famous Christ poll. Yeah. Uh, is this saying that Jesus was a heavenly being who became human and then was super exalted to the level just below Yahweh? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, I mean, it is, you could possibly read it this way, that it, it's a, it's a, it's a heaven, not necessarily divine in the same way that God is divine, but it could be an angel who becomes human and then becomes the super duper uber mega angel mm-hmm. at the right hand of the father who gets the honorary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could read it that way. Uh, I choose not to read it that way. Cause I think it makes more sense yeah. to read it as Jesus, as a preexistent being who is already equal with God becomes human and then is exalted back to his heavenly position, except now he's got the title Lord and all things in heaven and earth pay obeyance, worship to him. Now, you can read them both ways. The issue is which way of reading has more explanatory power for the world in the text, the world around the text, Mm -hmm. and the world, if you like, generated by the text or the, the the reception history. 
Now, on, on that calling, I, I think the, the second reading I gave you, my one, has more explanatory power. But I, I do understand and appreciate where he's coming from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he's got some views which, quite frankly, uh, yeah. uh, are about, about as convincing as vows of fidelity in a French wedding service. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, where he says, you know, where Paul says in Galatians, you know, when I was with you, you, you received me... Um, you, you received me like I was an angel, uh, like Christ Jesus himself. Mm-hmm. So I think, oh, can, you know, angel, Christ, maybe Christ is an angel. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I don't, I, don't, I don't know anyone who finds that remotely convincing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and that kind of thing. And the other thing you can say, like, if you look at the book of Revelation, um, Jesus is described with a lot of angelic qualities. The way Jesus is described in the book of Revelation, he is he he is described a little bit like some of the angels you find in Ezekiel, or you find in the book of Daniel. So he does have angelic qualities, uh, but he's also described as sitting on the divine side of the chasm. You know, chapter five on the chasm between God and creation. He's on the creation side. Yeah, and he's then, and seem he's to be then, like a ladder of divinity in some of these texts. It's like either you're divine. Well, it's not a ladder. There's a chasm, and no yeah. one can cross it. The big glass you see, yeah. nobody gets that. And the Lamb comes and takes the scroll from the Father, and He alone can execute. And then He receives all the worship of heaven. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's the Lamb and the worship. So in the Book of Revelation, you do have Jesus with sort of angelic qualities and you know angelic functions even but he's also described as you know sharing in the sovereignty and worship of the god of israel so i mean there are things there are certain tensions like that and these are both aspects in that and the other thing we have to be wary of and this is something um emin can exploit is you don't necessarily find uh the early church adopting the language of something like the nicene creed okay Mm -hmm. You don't have basically from day one after the ascension, people using the explicit language because that language came out of 300 years of debate of finding the ro- about 300 wrong yeah. ways of speaking about Jesus before they Got the right found one. something that yeah. explains what happens and what's said in scripture and also explains their own habits of worship and devotion. So, I mean, so, you know, Emin is, is, you know, plugging some good things. There's different ways of being divine. There's a diversity in the New Testament, and you can't assume that everyone's walking around with the Nicene Creed downloaded into their head ten minutes after the ascension. Yeah. And he's very good exploiting that. He's he um, is. oh yeah, he, he he's a he's a good he's a good um, uh, he, he's a mixture of a scholar with a little bit of P.T. Barn, a little bit of showmanship, <laughs> and he knows enough he knows enough of evangelical subculture to hit those notes that kind of rattle their cage. Yeah, yeah. and um. And he's offering a lot of pastoral care to ex-evangelicals who can keep right. their disgust with Christianity fresh. That's so right. so he's got the Muslim market cornered, the ex-evangelical market, the new atheists, everyone loves him. It's a it's a marketing, it's a marketing dream. That's right. Yeah. Um, I should add, can I just add to that? Yeah, um the, the debate I did with Ehrman is coming out now in book form. That's right. I was hearing about this, yeah. When God became Jesus. And that's um that's coming out. I think maybe between now and January. Okay. I think this interview um, comes out between now and January. So. It'll, yep. So uh, it'll so be, me me and um me and me and time. yeah me and Mano Amano uh, Ermina you can see in that book. Gotcha. Cool. So this before my last question, um, and this may be bridge into the last question. We'll we'll assume biblical authority, and we'll assume because we have a, a couple other episodes on um. Can we rely on the New Testament? So we'll assume we can rely on the New Testament manuscripts. We can rely on what the Bible is saying is um, is is reliable. So we'll assume that. Um, so we're not going to talk about kind of other stuff. But if we're looking at just the Bible itself, Old Testament, New Testament, does does it show forth Jesus as not just kind of a divine being in some ethereal or um, angelic sense, but does it show him forth as as God? Oh, I believe I, undoubtedly, and in fact, a number of scholars would say, uh, if you take the total witness of the New Testament, you know, particularly some of the you know real high points like you know the Gospel of John, the Book of Hebrews, the Book of Revelation, there's there's no doubt that Jesus is being portrayed as an incredibly elevated uh, divine figure. Now, whether that's exactly the same as the Nicene formulation from the Council of Nicaea. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may contest that, 
But I would argue that the New Testament makes some incredibly strong affirmations of who Jesus is, his identity, how he is both a expression of God, but a distinct person at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is the affirmations of Jesus, the devotional habits of the first Christians that gave us statements or required us or put pressure on us to generate things like the Nicene Creed. Yep. So that, that's 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 what I would say. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, because it seems it, it seems like we're looking at the biblical witness. There's, I mean, there's just an interpretation that you can choose not to have it, but it, it seems like the most um, convincing interpretation. We're taking the Bible for what it says. That this is this is probably what it says. Um, so as we conclude, for for those who may not be convinced, like this is great, but you know what? I'm not. I'm just not. I'm not there yet. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure I can believe this stuff and. Jesus made some pretty fantastic claims and I'm really sure like if this is, if this is all true. Um, so if you can, if you can talk to what advice would you give to those who are, who are just not convinced or um, don't believe it. And then um, to, to attach that, can, can we be sure? Is, is it, is it possibly to be sure that Jesus was, and we'll say slash is both fully divine and fully human? Well, the fact that Jesus existed uh, as I think, you know, overwhelming number of historians agree that yeah, Jesus really did exist. Yeah. So he really is a human. Uh, he's really a human being, a real figure of flesh and blood history. On Jesus as God, uh, well, I think there's great testimony to his resurrection, and he continues to be a powerful force in people's lives across history, across the world, across culture, across language, and you can try for yourself in the laboratory of life to to worship, to follow the crucified and risen Lord. And uh, to quote, I believe it was Polycarp of Smyrna ahead of his martyr martyrdom, mm -hmm. who said uh, something to the effect of, you know, um, 80 years I have followed my Lord and he has done me no wrong. Uh, and that's why he refused to deny him at the very end. You know, he could have denied Christ by saving his life. And he said, you know, some 80 years I followed my Lord. How shall I now condemn him who loved me and saved me? Mm -hmm. And that's that's what it is for me. That's what it is uh, for me. So uh, I think we've got the testimony, but there's also the lived experience mm -hmm. of living, uh, living and following uh, the Lord whose yoke is easy. His burden is light. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not safe, but he's good. Mm -hmm. exactly that's good i love it yeah so as as we uh as we finish this off you talked about a couple of books maybe if you want to plug some of the stuff that you've written and some of the stuff that's coming out because um, you write a lot on christology early gospel stuff so yeah just plug away yeah well i mean the the big book i've got coming out and it's a massive book with baylor university press called jesus among the gods uh, i'm hoping that's going to open i hope that one's going to make a significant contribution to uh, the study of uh, Jesus' divinity in the ancient world. And yeah, I think I've got some some new ideas, some some new avenues, which I think need to be explored. And that's where I get to the, uh, that's basically, you know, I, I, I and analyze stuff like, you know, in what sense does Jesus resemble an angel? And in what sense does he not resemble an angel? Is Jesus similar to a deified emperor or is he kind of different? Um, is Jesus divine in the same way that Hercules or Heracles was divine? Is he like, you know, Isis and Osiris? Um, or, you know, what does the Old Testament say about the supernatural qualities of themselves? So that's a book where I explore all those sorts of things. Uh, the other one coming out is, you know, the one with, with Ehrman, um, which is when did Jesus become God? And that's effectively a summary of the debate we did with a little bit of extra commentary included where we kind of nut out some very specific issues. And uh, yeah, those books uh, I think will be very informative and helpful to anyone who's interested in the study of, of, uh, of, of Christology or wants to know more about who is Jesus with a real rigorous and academic level. Awesome, yeah. Well, Michael Bird, thank you so much for coming on our show, for talking about Christ and his divinity. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on and um, yeah, we would love to, to keep this conversation going in the future. It's great. It's great talking to you, Peter and Nick. And if you see Nick, tell him that the fact that we had this conversation today, I think means he's now obligated to to name any son after me. So the son should be okay. called Michael. Maybe if it's a baby girl that they get, maybe Michelle. That's right. I don't know. Or, Michaela, or maybe, maybe Michaela. Yeah. Michael or yeah. Michaela. 
Okay. I would I would feel deeply honored. If he names if he names his son or daughter Michael or Michaela, I'll give him a free copy of my next book. That sounds like a fair deal. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, I'll let them know. I'm sure I'm sure his wife will be very down for that. She'll it's like, oh, okay, that makes total sense. We'll we'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, naming rights and a child for a free book, kid. <laughs> yeah great swap great swap exactly yeah they'll do it all all day long <clears throat> well thank you so much it's been a pleasure talking to you great talking to you and uh big hello to all your and uh, th thank you for having me to all your listeners yeah thank you much